So thank you everybody for coming today. Um, really excited about today's presentation. Oops. Um, and so we have uh, Emily Rapart speaking. She grew up at for Shalom and um, has been a teacher at St. John's for quite a few years. And so she is going to present today at um, her presentation topic is how to navigate academic hurdles with your middle and high schoolers. So take it away. Thanks, Karen. All right, well, um, really briefly, um, a couple just things I wanna preface. Um, I, as much as I'm excited to share this information, just know that um, this is not uh, an exhaustive list of information and I don't have all of the answers nor do I have a prescription for these types of challenges. So um, just take that with, take it with a grain of salt and know that um, there are a lot of resources out there um, and conversations that should be had when these are topics at hand. But um, these slides are also gonna be available to anybody who wants them. And if you know somebody who might benefit, um, who's not here today, you're welcome to share the information or even just pass my name along. My contact info is there as well or in the British Loan directory. Um, so, but on that note, thank you to everybody who is joining us today. I really appreciate it. Appreciate the turnout. And <laughs> um, we're gonna get started. Um, I just really, really quick, everybody, most of you guys know me, so I won't spend too much time talking about myself, but I've been teaching for eight years. Um, I've been teaching upper level science uh, since I graduated from the University of Miami. And uh, that's ranged from covering for um, some long-term maternity leave in middle school. Uh, most of my teaching experience is in high school, but I also spend a lot of time uh, as a private tutor. Um, my area as a tutor is both content specific, which we'll talk about today, kind of the different types of tutors that are out there, um, as well as study skills and executive functioning skills. Um, executive functioning skills are more along the lines of um, keeping yourself organized and um, finding ways to engage actively in, uh, in a classroom or in an academic setting. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about myself. Um, this is kind of our plan for the day. Um, we're going to be talking about how to uh, prevent problems, um, how to really start the year off by laying a strong foundation. Um, um, then following that, we're, uh, oh, there's Antelise. Hi, Antelise. Hello. Um, we're going to be talking about how to then identify concerning habits. So at what point do you kind of want to or what do you want to be on the lookout for, essentially? Um, and then from there, we're going to go into how to kind of triage and address some of these concerns um, initially with resources at home um, and then possibly with resources at the school. Um, and then from there, we're going to talk about why and when you might want to call in a professional or somebody who you'd likely be paying uh, to be able to get guidance and advice. Um, we'll wrap up with questions. So um, I ask that in the meantime, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat. Um, Karen's gonna help me kind of moderate the questions, but we'll definitely have time at the end to be able to, to go through things uh, more, more thoroughly um, that you have them. So, all right, on that note, Okay, so one of the most important things I would say in terms of setting your student and your child up for success is starting off your, uh, starting off your year uh, strong. So the year is typically in a school system is broken into two semesters, right? So you have your fall semester and spring semester. And both of those are really good opportunities prior to the year starting to uh, have these conversations and uh, set your child up for, for academic success. 
Um, and also social emotional success as well. That's definitely a really big part of academic success for, for our students. Um, going into the school year, this is not something I would say that we're doing on the first week of school. This is something that we're doing uh, before the first week of school. Um, you know, maybe that week prior as you're really starting to gear up and buy school supplies, that's a great time because kids are perhaps getting excited about school. Uh, so maybe lean on that, um, lean on that motivation that they already have. Um, so what are some things you can do? So, and by the way, I know that this is, these are conversations uh, that I'm talking about having with your middle schooler and your high schooler, um, but it, you, um, you can definitely lay this groundwork with kids that are at a younger age as well. These are all skills and things that you can model or have your older students model as well for your younger students. Um, all right, so planners are super important because they help your child uh, maintain accountability um, for what they're hearing um, in the classroom. And it also helps them maintain accountability for when they come home and they're able to translate what they heard in the classroom to what they're what they should be doing at home. Um, it's it's a skill that takes time to develop, so it's not wouldn't be surprising if that's something that they need you to show them how to do at the beginning. Um, but you can definitely make it fun. You know, you can go shopping for a planner or have them kind of pick something out that they like. I definitely encourage, especially at a younger age, that if you're, if you're looking for, if, excuse me, if you're shopping for something, that you're weary of using just kind of a regular um, like daily calendar because you wanna make sure that it's gonna be set up so that they can reflect an academic day on, on each of the days that's presented on the, on the actual paper. Um, but it should be a hard copy, um, especially when they're developing these skills. Um, so from there, the other thing that's super, super important is to establish a routine and to have established homework and study areas in your house. Um, so your routine should be both leading up to the, the school day and also coming back, coming back down from the school day. Um, all of these things, all of these resources and conversations are things that work in a virtual setting as well. Um, but it's really key to have that, that plan, making sure that they understand that once they've, you know, they, they're expected to wake up at a certain time, they're expected to eat breakfast, they're expected to get dressed, they're expected to eat lunch. And when they come home, what does that routine look like on the back end? And that'll really help establish the mindset of how they're gonna um, sh shift into and out of their academic setting. Um, having these established study areas are also gonna help them focus and make sure that they're geared for success because if they're in a place that's poorly lit or perhaps they are you know, distracted, there are other people in the area, um, they might have, a, they might be fighting an uphill battle to be able to get their work done and it might not even be their fault. Um, so you want to be able to set up space that uh, they're seated, they have all of the materials that they need kind of at their fingertips. Um, there's enough light for them to be able to, to see and they sh definitely shouldn't be laying down. Um, and I would also would discourage like any opportunity for multitasking in their area. So try to avoid eating and other technolo technological distractions. Um, that's a kind of a good segue into making sure that you establish technological boundaries from the beginning. Um, these are conversations and you'll kind of see the pattern throughout the presentation that the, the theme I would say throughout this is parental involvement. That um, you're on your child's team to help them succeed, um, but you're not doing it for them. You're teaching them how to do it. You're teaching them how to, um, how to develop these skills, um, but you're also the parent. You, wanna, you definitely wanna set the boundaries and the expectations, and that's hopefully what you're doing um, you know, 
before the school year starts. And then a good, like I said, a good opportunity is to do that again before the spring semester starts. Um, so making sure to set those expectations from the beginning. All right. All right, so perhaps, you know, you've, you've set those expectations. You've, you've had these conversations with your child um, and the year has begun, um, but it's still off to a rocky start. That's very normal. Um, it's something that, you know, life happens. Um, and even if you've had the conversation and you've set the expectations, um, it still can get a little dicey at times and stressful, absolutely. So what are some things that you wanna be on the lookout for? Um, and again, this is not exhaustive. So just know that these are some of the heavy hitters that I tend to see from my experience, both as a teacher and as a tutor. Um, so first off, disorganization in terms of supplies. That is, that's a major problem. And the reason why is because if your child's backpack or their notebook looks like the one that's on the picture, um, or on the slide, I should say, they're going to probably have a very difficult time finding and retrieving and completing assignments. Um, it spirals pretty quickly. Um, so things might, you know, rip, they might bend or break or just get lost in the shuffle between subjects. And something that they had fully intended to do in a reasonable amount of time and get in on time or use as a study, a study tool to prepare for a test is virtually useless in the midst of this black hole situation. Um, so you, and I'll talk about how to kind of deal with this stuff, but that's definitely a sign of concern. Um, another sign of concern is just avoiding conversations, which can also be just a habit of being a teenager, but um, in general, any major changes in um, major changes in their types of conversations that they're having with you. So all of a sudden they went from being willing to share information about school to uh, avoiding the conversation or really, really limiting their uh, limiting what they're willing to speak to you about. Um, those are those are definitely signs of concern as well. Um, and from that same similar standpoint, um, if they just constantly reassure you that everything's fine, class is going great, it's fine, it's good, it's okay, but they're not really able to show you or um, demonstrate with evidence that things are fine and okay, then that's another reason to be concerned. Um, you you want to have evidence-based justification from these kiddos, even if it's, hey, can you show me that you finished this or show me the grade that you got on this? Um, another sign of concern is if you're constantly hearing from their teacher or teachers, um, whether it's uh, because of missing or late assignments or you know, concerning behavior in the classroom, um, regular communication from the teacher that uh, has concerning behavior is definitely something to be out on the lookout for that you want to try to address all of these things um, as early as possible. Um, the last thing that I have on here is irregular sleep patterns. Um, and I had mentioned in my previous slide that you want to really prioritize sleep. Sleep is possibly aside from getting your nourishment, your food, one of the most important things in helping a child be successful in school. Um, giving them a chance to sleep at least, you know, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but giving them a chance to have a full night's sleep about eight hours or depending on the age um, and having a routine to be able to go to bed and wake up in the morning is going to give them an opportunity to be more attentive both in the classroom and also avoid a lot of struggles in, in the morning and in the evening when you're trying to build up or wind down. Um, so again, shifting from more of a regular routine to irregular patterns of that um, is definitely something that you want to address as early as possible. All right. So 
these are all things that as parents you can do with your child regardless of whether you've seen some of those concerning signs um, or not. I strongly recommend that you keep an open line of dialogue with your children to be able to engage them and to know what's happening in their academic life. Um, and, and that would allow them to present more information to you and for you to ask more pointed questions to them Again, really the goal is to hold them accountable for their, their actions and their behavior. Um, so first off, almost all schools that I, certainly the, all the ones that I've worked with um, in the last eight years, um, but almost all the ones that I've been exposed to have an online portal of some kind, um, especially now that we've segued into having like a virtual or a hybrid option for school these days. Um, and it's really important to know, of course, how to access that, but also what does that online portal offer? And every school has a different platform or a different amount of information that they're willing to provide to the parents um, and to the students, I should say. Um, you can kind of see at the bottom of my screen here, sort of a snippet of what ours looks like for our school. Um, this is my vantage point. So the students access looks a little bit different and the parents access looks a little bit different. And even other schools that use the same, they pay for the same service, they can change how much information students and parents um, and teachers have access to. Um, so just be familiar with it first off. Um, if you don't know how to get there, um, reach out to an administrator. Uh, usually an administrative assistant can kind of walk you through how to initially do that. Um, on a similar note, it's really important to know how you can monitor and kind of keep an eye on your child's grades and their assignments. Um, and we'll use that information in our next, my next slide in just a second, but it's good to have that information. Often those two things kind of go hand in hand. Um, but again, using that planner, uh, if you lean on them for that, then you ask them to, um, show you what they've written down and then you can kind of cross check it potentially with their online resources um, then you're able to again continue to hold them accountable um, the other piece of this is to really encourage your child to be in an open communication have an open line of communication with their teacher um, so that especially in in the upper level grades, so certainly high school, but also I think now that we're segued into our high tech society that this works for applies for middle school as well, that most of the communication is happening via email these days. The students actually are kind of almost nervous to go sometimes face to face, um, but email communication is great. Um, I would strongly encourage you to even walk your child through how to write an email to their teacher. Um, when they when they're initially doing it for the first time, I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten from students that don't have a salutation or don't have any kind of like uh, um, signature at the bottom and just have a question. Um, and I usually will actually respond and ask them to write it a little bit more formally next time, um, just to consider that they are speaking with a professional. Um, so, especially from a young age, teaching them how to do that, walking them through that, asking them for careful consideration in a circumstance that they're looking for flexibility will usually lead to more leniency on the end of the teacher as well. Um, so use that as a learning opportunity. Um, and that, again, that should really be in the hands of your child. Um, and if you're thinking, oh, my child's only, you know, 11, like they're not expected to do that. Um, again, learning opportunity, sit down with them, show them how to do it, and then you'll be surprised how quickly they'll pick up on that. I mean, they're already probably better versed at a lot of this tech stuff than we all are, to be honest. Um, another thing is you really want to make it a part of your daily routine to check in with them. Um, you, it's, this should not be like a once in a while situation. Um, you want to remain as engaged as possible, and that will continue to hold them accountable for, um, for their actions and for their behavior. 
So those are some kind of initial triages that you can do. Um, and on a similar note, um, it's really tempting to ask your child, how was your day? And most people who especially have middle schoolers and early high school or even later high schoolers, their answer is fine or okay. And then it's kind of hard to know what follow-up question to ask. Did you say, what did you learn today? Did you say, did you talk to so-and-so today? The questions are very surface level. And that's just, it's just not enough, especially if you're noticing a lot of these signs of concern that I pointed out before. Um, so you want to change your questions to make them more pointed, to make them more productive, so that you're going to get more information um, from your child, uh, who will be more, um, that when you give them more guidance in their question, they're more likely to have more information to share with you. Um, so I've given you a, a laundry list of examples here. I'm not gonna go through all of them because they certain, excuse me, they certainly don't apply to everybody here, but um, you can take your time and, and kind of look through them and even look through them on your own time when you're looking on the slides. But a couple examples that I, I really like to emphasize um, are the, the actually the very last question here um, is how do you plan to juggle um, and then insert you know maybe a sport or a rehearsal or some kind of outside extracurricular activity with and then insert the academic commitment um, again knowing and hopefully anticipating that you're aware of what their their week sort of looks like um, you might have an idea that they have a test in math and a quiz in history, um, but they're also slated to be up pretty late or out late doing uh, dress rehearsals for the spring play, um, or they have two baseball games that week. Um, and that kind of that time stuff takes away from that, um, their ability to commit and follow through on even other daily assignments that are gonna be due that week. Um, so if their answer is, I don't know, to these questions, or th they can't provide you with the information because they're not there yet, that's okay. Again, learning opportunity. Have the conversation. Say, okay, so let's come up with a plan. Let's figure out how to manage the time. Let's literally budget our time for the week, so that way you go into your assessments and your rehearsals and you're not, you're not stressed and you're not feeling like you are losing sleep over, over this, these commitments. Um, another thing to consider is going, coming out of larger assignments, um, helping them evaluate how they did. Um, how did you feel about your essay that you wrote for English? You know, do you wanna maybe take a guess as to how you did? And then when they get the grade back, it helps to evaluate that emotional component of it, right? So maybe they estimated that they got an 85, just ballparking, and then they ended up getting an 80, right? So they probably had a mental goal at that point of having an 85. So helping them to say, well, what happened, right? Or maybe they got a 75 right? Helping them understand where do we make up, how do I make up those 10 points in the future, right? What needed to happen? Did we not use the rubric? Did we not communicate with our teachers? Did we turn it in late? Where, where was the issue there? So that way you can figure out moving forward, right? If the 85 is still kind of, whether it's the goal or that's how they felt coming out of it, that it's more of a genuine estimate. Um, they're, they're really able to gauge how they think that they did going into the assignment, or I should say coming out of the assignment. Okay. All right, so before you engage with a professional outside of a class, 
excuse me, a professional that you are going to pay for extra assistance. Um, I strongly encourage students and parents to be communicating with the instructors. Um, it's, it again helps maintain accountability, um, but it also helps to provide a more clear picture as to what the child really needs in order to succeed in the classroom or in that particular classroom. And that's not really something that uh, a third party tutor is gonna be able to identify for you. Um, it doesn't matter if they graduated from the best school at the top of their class, they're not in the classroom with your child and the teacher. So they need that context. It always helps to have that context from the instructors to be able to succeed with working with your child um, outside of the classroom. So these are some questions that you can certainly pose to the teacher. You know, if you feel like you're at the point where you're kind of hitting your head against the wall, your child isn't even willing to reach out or communicate to the teacher, you know, you can certainly intervene and ask to be able to get this pointed information. So, you know, what kinds of challenges do you notice specifically that my child is having in your class? Is it effort-based? Is it organizational-based? Are they distracted? Are they, you know, can, are they not able to even wrap their head around the information? Um, you know, what, what resources might you suggest for supplemental help? Is my child using supplemental help at all? Are they, are office hours available? All of these things that perhaps are available, but if they're um, embarrassed or if they're kind of at a point where they feel like it's too little too late, they might not be utilizing them. Um, but all of this stuff is not um, like, getting outside help is not a replacement for parental involvement and it's not a replacement for seeking guidance from an instructor. It should be in addition to those things. So in order for the child to reap the benefits of growth and improvement, they have to be able to pull their weight um, to be able to utilize the resources that are available to them um, in the, in in the classroom and, and outside of the classroom as well. All right, so now we've gotten this far um, and it's just things just aren't working. Things are difficult. Um, your child is struggling. Um, they, it's, it's a constant battle. Um, and if that's the case, um, and you feel like you've exhausted, um, you've exhausted a lot of possible opportunities, um, then yes, I think calling in a professional that you're going to pay for extra assistance, a third party, um, is a great idea. There are a whole bunch of different types of um, third party professionals who can help you. Um, and they, of course, all range their, their, the reason why you would call them would vary based on what the issue is that you're having with your, uh, with your child. Um, so there's everything from someone who's going to help explain content, like a subject specific tutor, to someone who's going to help with executive functioning and study skills. Um, there are people who are literally called homework wranglers who will sit with you, your child to basically watch them do their homework if it's a struggle for you to help them do that. Um, and then if you're having other um, more diagnostic issues, um, then you might want to lean on someone who's going to like a psychiatrist who's going to help you do a psychoed evaluation that's more of an extensive, um, extensive professional that you would probably be seeking guidance through your also your child's pediatrician, perhaps administrators at the school as well. Um, and then if you're at the maybe junior senior level, you might also consider getting help from a college guidance counselor, depending on where your child is in the college uh, seeking college seeking journey. Um, so these are, those are the types of instructors, but when you would want to call in for help, uh, like I said, if you feel like you're really hitting your head against the wall at this point, um, don't like stop and get help. Like that's okay. Um, if it's just a constant battle 
for you to be able to help your child make progress, to complete work, to, um, I mean, kind of any and all of the above that we've described before. It's just, it's constantly an argument. Bring in the third party, see if that kind of eases the tension because what you're doing is you're just constantly surrounding schoolwork with negativity and that's only gonna make the issue worse. Um, also, perhaps it's crunch time. It's, we're kind of coming up on finals right now ourselves, uh, slowly but surely, um, midterms, that type of the year. Um, and if it's been really, really difficult in terms of understanding the material, um, that might also be a good time to call in for someone to at least help them break down the material and get through these more heavy hitting assessments for the school year. That way they don't crash and burn in the, uh, the last minute. Um, on a similar note, if they're struggling, you know, academically, in, or I should say if they're struggling in a specific content area, and it's certainly not your wheelhouse, which happens to all of us, we only have so many skills that we are, uh, that, that we can excel in, um, then, you know, it might help to bring in someone whose expertise is a particular subject, or um, who's, who's able to kind of articulate the information at a higher level that you, that you can't necessarily help them with. Um, what else was I just gonna say? Um, oh, the other concern that I, would, uh, that I would be on the lookout for is if, if your child is working really, really hard to uh, exhaust all of these resources, they're attending tutorials, they're asking for help, they're staying on top of their assignments, um, and either A, they just can't wrap their head around it, or uh, B, they um, aren't finishing things in a time, like they're not finishing timed assignments in, in the amount of time that they're given, um, then that's also a good opportunity to call in someone that's a, a professional to be able to maybe help them navigate that process. Um, and consider and start to ask the questions like, you know, what's holding you back from finishing these assignments within the allotted time, um, especially if they're really doing their their best to be able to to succeed in that way. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my my arc. I would say, um, like I said one more time, this isn't exhaustive. This is not a prescription. Um, I just wanted to kind of introduce some. Uh, general ideas to plant the seed if you are having some struggles or if you know of someone who's struggling in that regard. Um, and just to know that like there's no better opportunity to start than any any time. Like it doesn't it doesn't have to be at the beginning or at a certain time of the year. Um, just getting that conversation going, helping your child learn how to be a self-advocate is is going to help them much in, in, in the long term. It's not even just the short term. Um, so yeah, are there any questions? I have a question. Yeah, hold on. I think we have a couple in the chat. So. You do, me... but why, why not take, do you wanna take, take the live one first? And the, okay. Because the things okay, in the cool. chat All have right. already been, you know, written out. Okay, cool. All right, um, go for it. Okay. Maura. Well, just out of curiosity, I wonder what your opinion would be or advice, whatever. If you have um, a child who is a, who's really smart and doesn't have to put in a lot of work to get good grades and maybe doesn't really need to study that much and but they still get good grades, would would you still want to do something to be like, well, you, you should still develop good study habits or would you really not need to do anything because they're making good grades? So what does it matter? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I would say um, that a lot of these habits are gonna be really important later in life as well. Um, and that a lot of skills that you use in the professional world don't necessarily require you to study and perform on a test that's, you know, in within a certain time frame. but you still have to 
um, show up and present and deposit material perhaps to a team. And all of those things um, still lean on accountability and knowing how to ask questions and knowing um, how to manage your time. So as a person who has information that's coming to them really naturally, um, who doesn't necessarily have to, to study, um, should still learn how to manage their time um, and communicate with adults that are important in, in that process of whatever, whatever stage they're at in life. So communicating with um, a teacher or communicating with a guidance counselor um, and doing it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I remember from an experience that I had with a close friend in high school, he was incredibly bright and he was able to manage work very, very, very quickly, but he left everything to the last minute. And I didn't, I couldn't wrap my head around that because I had to, I had to dole out my time to be able to do well on the assessment. And I, I'm not in touch with him as an adult, but, um, you know, I, I think it's, these are skills that are translatable in, in a lot of ways to other components of your life. And I think that as parents, it's important to be able to encourage these skills to be able to ensure that, you know, if they're struggle or if they're not struggling academically, but they're not getting enough sleep, um, then you might see other issues that develop later. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely, definitely keep an eye on it and encourage this to be able to just maintain good habits. Yeah, Audrey. I have a question. So um, my concerns are more about um not everyday school and being organized and being prepared for tests, but the addition of standardized testing that's coming up, let's say we're gonna take the IC to get into high school and uh, our attempt at IC the first go to get into middle school was not happy for anybody involved. And so i um, curious about how would a middle school prepare, middle schooler prepare for that? And it, when do you call in the big guns to um, actually prepare them for the test? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I have a mixed bag of emotions about, um, about the IC. Um, I think that you have to be really careful because those exams are trying really hard to assess the uh, current level of um, your, your child's current capabilities. Um, but they're also used to allow for entrance into uh, programs. So it's very, very, very popular to get tutors for these children to be able to do well on these assign on these uh, standardized tests. Um, I, I mean, I think that again, this is my opinion in from my experience. I think if you find that you're at a, uh, an, a, you're at an emotional standstill with your child and it is a, it's getting them to the, they would, they would feel better with um, academic support to be able to get them through that exam. Um, and that's something that you can afford to provide for them. Um, I would say do what helps them in that social emotional aspect, help them to you know, testing is, can be very stressful. And I would try to remove that stress aspect from them because they might actually perform better. They might have more confidence if they have somebody who's kind of coaching them along the way. Um, and they might be able to demonstrate their natural ability a little bit more. Um, they also might have a lot more to show. They just kind of need someone to help chip away at the top level to like help them figure out like just how to take the test, like how to budget their time when they're sitting um, in what is already a very stressful environment. Um, so I, if you're already feeling like it's, it's an emotional toll, I think that you might want to consider that option. Um, if if they're not particularly motivated um, to do much on their own, um, then getting a tutor 
probably is just a band-aid to be honest. They have to be willing to do the work outside of working with a tutor as well. So likely that's going to be using a, an IC prep book um, or something along those lines in between tutoring sessions, unless you have someone who's there with them every day after school, which, you know, kudos to you. Um, but <laughs> I think that most people have someone who's there, you know, kind of once or twice a week um, or on the weekends and your, your child is gonna need to supplement on their own. If they can't or they're not willing to do that, then you're paying a lot of money for a, for a Band-Aid is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. Okay, um, and Elise, I think your hand was up. It was, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, Emily, I have to say this was so incredibly informative, mm -hmm. having, having lived through this um, and still living through it. Um, I wish that I had seen you do this presentation about eight years ago because I learned the hard way through a lot of this and even still there were a lot of really good reminders and suggestions. So it was incredibly helpful and I'd love to see your, your slide deck. Um, if possible, I don't know if you can email that out or, but yes, it, it just, is, it, it's definitely coming out to you guys for sure. Okay, cool. It's just a really good reminder. Cause I think the other thing I would say to everybody is sometimes when you're mired in the middle of it, like you start out really good and strong and then like you forget or like you go down a different path. And so it's just, it's just really good checklist to always remember kind of what, what you, what you need to do. So, and um, God bless people that don't have to go through all of this, but I haven't found anybody yet. <laughs> yeah, thank you. About right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So now may be time to grab the, the questions from the chat. Okay, cool. So um, looks like we have uh, one question and a comment. Um, so the, the first question, well, the question is, um, how do you feel about parents checking their kids' work and pointing out errors? So that's a really good question. I would say, you know, any, I, um, when you're, I, I don't, let me think, sorry, let me think about this for a second. I would say it's, it's good to help them understand how to uh, learn how to look for those errors themselves. So you have to start by showing them what those errors look like. So when I was in, you know, elementary school, um, often my mom would check my math homework before I could go play because if I, if she didn't, then what might happen is I might rush through the assignment in order to get it done and then put the assignment in my homework folder and then I'm done for the day. Um, but if she checked it, then it was more valuable to me to make sure that I tried to do it right the first time because then I would spend less time uh, correcting my mistakes. Um, and same goes for things like editing an essay, um, you know, helping, helping your child to cultivate those skills. Um, there's definitely a point where I would say there's too much help. Um, you know, if you feel like you're saying that we did the project together, you're, you're probably giving them too much help. <laughs> but, you know, you kind of have to go with your gut a little bit. Um, you know, it's one thing to go out and buy the supplies from Michael. It's another thing to, you know, trace the letters for them. Like it doesn't have to look perfect. The essay isn't, the essay doesn't have to be perfect. The homework doesn't have to be flawless. They, these teachers are not expecting, if they were, they, it would be a whole different story. So don't feel like the expectation has to be like, you know, a perfection when they're submitting. The goal is that they're trying to figure out how to do the best that they can. Um, but the best that they can is also not rushing through the assignment just to get it done to move on, right? Helping them learn that they want a budget time to be able to check their work, for example, um, or have time to edit, right? If you do the essay um, and you wait until the night 
before it's due, then you're probably not going to have enough time to even sit down and edit it. Um, so yeah, I would say within reason, um, helping them kind of figure that out um, early and then then they'll be proud to show you the work that they've done too. So um, yeah. And the yeah. other comment kind of interesting piggyback on Maura's question, Maura's question earlier was um, about asking detailed questions at the end of the day, excuse me. Um, that's a good practice about learning how to interview for a job. Um, so yeah, so a lot of these things can, like I mentioned earlier, they can be translated to different like aspects of of even adult life too. Um, so yeah. yeah. So I kind of kind of related to that whole transferable skill. Um, I, my kids do fairly well academically, but they definitely still have a lot of growth in how they interact with adults and how they interact with authority figures. And so um, I, I really kind of would like to run with your suggestion of having them email their teachers just again to <laughs> because they don't know formal letter letter structure and that is a really good life skill so i guess i was curious as a teacher do we just get there um i i guess just to develop to to develop that suggestion a little bit you know i can picture getting the teacher's addresses off the, the school web page because I, I think sometimes when I email them through grade speed, they there's a very delayed lag in them getting the notification. And so I'd, I I also would like my child to know that they're, you know, I, I'd like that whole closing the loop. So I guess I just thought I would ask, I'd like to run with that suggestion. Can you develop more as a teacher how to make that suggestion the most effective? Yeah, for sure. I would say um, a lot of the, um, the, uh, the ability to um, communicate with instructors is quite readily available. Um, it's kind of just taking the first plunge to either get that information and or um, having your child have like, like giving them the skills to be able to do it or having them under identify and understand at what point in time is an appropriate time to reach out and communicate with a teacher. So those are kind of the three components. Um, uh, there should, your, your teacher, your child's teacher's email should be available through at the very least the school or district's website. Um, and from there, um, you know, if you can imagine kind of as an adult why you would want to reach out to someone for perhaps clarification, um, or perhaps you made a mistake and you need to, whether it's in your professional work, line of work, or even in a social uh, instance, um, you made a mistake and you need to kind of backtrack and you need to address the mistake. Um, those are like the two heavy hitters in terms of why uh, a a child can start to communicate with their teacher. Um, where is the assignment posted? How do I turn it in? Um, can you clarify what's going to be on the assessment on Friday? Um, all of those things are, even if they were said in the classroom, which they probably were, um, that's okay. Uh, they're just practicing the communication aspect of it. Um, not turning something in uh, should be, a, uh, you know, I apologize, I'm, I made a mistake, um, owning up to the mistake. Um, is it possible to submit this late? Um, can I get any partial credit? Are, these are the types of questions that you can kind of when you're apologizing, essentially, or when you're just acknowledging that a mistake was made. Um, the answer might be no, but it's certainly better to ask than it is to, um, to sit on it. Um, and what that's going to do is when your child is in ninth, 10th, 11th grade, um, when it comes time for looking for someone to write them a letter of recommendation, um, the, their teachers who they communicate with regularly are gonna have a lot more to say about that child. 
um, you know, so-and-so is more than willing to own up to, you know, mistakes that they've made and learn from them. You know, so-and-so is, you know, constantly reaching out to ask, you know, in terms of my availability to supplement uh, or to have, you know, to sit down with them for office hours. Um, and again, all of these things are different opportunities that are available at different stages during, during, you know, that might not be available to a sixth grader, um, but it's, it's very helpful for even a sixth grader to learn how to write to their teacher and say, um, I, I did not hear the instructions in class. That was my mistake. Can you please clarify for me? That's okay. Now, I don't know that they'll get a response by the time that the assignment is due, but that's a natural consequence, right? That's mm -hmm. something that now the now that person needs to live with and they, they're gonna have to do the best that they can. And then the follow-up, right, can be when they see them the next day in class and they can say, Mrs. Rupert, I sent you an email last night. I was just curious if you got it. Um, I've gotten a couple of those, I, I respond pretty quickly, but that's kind of the next way is like teaching them that they can ask in person, right? Having them go to, but when you do it online, when you do it with an email, um, you can also see it, right? So that's kind of the other benefit of teaching them how to use um, and write emails um, that way. Um, can I ask a question? Uh, can I yeah, say sure. a comment? Um, sure. Emily, Mrs. Rapper. Yes. <laughs> it is such a thrill to see you in a professional. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. Okay. I learned a lot and I wish I had other people to impart your knowledge on, but I'm sort of happy I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm glad well you joined us. You get an A plus. Thanks. Appreciate the support. Any other I questions? Question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, this is a question, uh, I, I, um, a question from a different generation. I'm just curious because uh, I guess as the recipient of, of your students, you know, working with people, working with younger people, being their boss, having them as my colleagues, I'm wondering, uh, you know, with this issue about communicating appropriately with email and salutations and closings and punctuation, sentence structure. Um, and then, you know, like uh, Zoom behavior and- you, you're, you're just describing stuff to me. You're gonna have to actually ask a question. I'm, I'm getting there, I'm okay. getting there. Are those topics brought, are, are they topics of, uh, instruction that most teachers deal with or is this stuff that the parents are expected to do? Um, I mean, I think that that's definitely something that varies depending on, you know, the type of classroom and the personality of the teacher um, and also the personality of and the involvement of a parent. You know, I think that it's not uncommon to see parents take these types of uh, these things for granted and just basically assume that since their child is using a computer that they know how to do all of this stuff. Um, that's not usually the case. Um, I mean, honestly, like a lot of kids don't even know how to address an envelope these days mm -hmm. because they don't write, um, they don't write letters. Um, so, and then, you know, parents send their kids to summer camp and they d like literally don't know how to write an envelope to, to write letters home. Um, I, I think there are a lot of assumptions that are made. Um, I think that there are a lot of teachers who love their job and cherish their students and are more than willing to show them how it's done. Um, but we also have, you know, multiple classes and a lot of kids and it's not certainly, it's, it's not something that's gonna be built into a curriculum. Um, it's going to be something that a genuinely caring, good teacher is going to find a way to model and, um, and guide their students with. Um, but it's not going to be, you know, if you want your child to be able to model that information and, and 
communicate effectively, whether it's on a Zoom call um, or whether it's in an email or on the phone or in person, um, modeling it and teaching them what you would expect are like the token to success. Uh, you, I wouldn't say that you can expect a teacher to be able to do that. And, but hopefully, hopefully you have a, you know, you've got a, you've got a good one, <laughs> but yeah. Well, I guess that means to me that at some point it's possible that part of our roles as employers is going to, we, we can't assume that everyone's going to have those skills. Yeah. I, I think as an employer, I think that again, you, you know, you can kind of think back to like the beginning of the presentation. Like you really want to just constantly set the expectation from the beginning. You know, like if you expect your employee to answer with an, an email in a certain way, you know, based off of your particular relationship, um, meaning like you, you, you would be particularly disrespected if there wasn't a salutation or a signature in the email, then, um, you know, I think that part of like, if, if you really don't, quite frankly, don't care, then that's not something that you need to communicate. But if it's particularly important to you, or, you know, perhaps you're, you know, you work in a line of work with donors, you know, if it's extremely important that every time you communicate with a donor, that it's done in a consistent way, then that's something that like during like an onboarding process that you need to articulate to your employees, just like you would during what I would call like an onboarding part of a school year, right? During the spring or the, the fall and during the beginning of the spring, you know, you need to be setting these expectations to your child um, or to your employee. employee. Um, because if you don't set the expectation, um, again, in either of these situations, you, the, the, it's all subject to interpretation. And we all come from different backgrounds and, and different, different families. And it's not fair to hold different expect different interpretations against somebody unless you've made it really clear what you what you want them to to do for you mm -hmm. yeah and then if you set those expectations and it's your job to also follow through and say to them you didn't do this you know you didn't follow through on something that i asked you to do um I'd like to point that out to you so that way it doesn't doesn't happen again, essentially. Yeah. Any other questions? No, actually, I was going to just make a comment that it's one. So I am going to stop the recording.